I'm Dr. Vanessa Sinclair, and this is Rendering Unconscious. My guest today is Dr. Michael Stewart Garfinkel, a licensed clinical psychologist and psychoanalyst in private practice in New York City. Rendering Unconscious is also a book. Rendering Unconscious, Psychoanalytic Perspectives, Politics, and Poetry. Available from Trapart Books, 2019. For more, please visit our publisher's website, trapart.net. That's T-R-A-P-A-R-T dot net. You can support the podcast by visiting our Patreon, p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash v-a-n-e-s-s-a two three c-a-r-l. Your support is greatly appreciated. Links to everything can be found in the text accompanying this episode. start wherever i mean I, analysts usually start by saying nothing just to be fair yeah i know yeah i know <laughs> be a long stare yeah yeah, yeah. we could stare at each other uh-huh. and i'll make sure to, to record the video too right that's right they could, <laughs> they could get a session <laughs> two analysts in a face-off that's exactly right <laughs> We could have 45 variable length sessions in the next hour or so. <laughs> <laughs> well, why don't you start with maybe why you started to go into psychoanalysis and then we can make sure we get to everything else from there. Does that make sure. sense? Sure. Yeah, that sounds fine. So why I became an analyst and how I became an analyst, um, it was, uh, I think, compared to some people I know later than others and compared to, I guess, you know, people find it at different times. Um when I was at the end of high school, I was doing research in cardiology. Uh, a family friend who was a cardiologist at a local hospital uh, kind of took an interest in me and asked me if I wanted to get some work experience in. And so he invited me on to help in research projects. And at the beginning, started with data entry for meta-analyses, which was not the most riveting, although it was interesting because I was in the beginning of 12th grade, so it felt like kind of a real work different than other work I was doing. Um, But when it became clear enough that I could get through data entry soon, uh, quickly, I uh, ended up doing work that was more substantive, like actually getting into research, and I kind of had in my mind that a life trajectory at that point would probably lead to becoming a medical doctor and then an interventional cardiologist. Uh, but what I discovered along the way were a few things, I think, that kind of shamed, changed that for me. Uh, I was always a reasonably good student, good at basic sciences and math and all of this, and I decided that I could turn all of that, plus a wish to kind of do something clinical, into being a doctor. But I was in Toronto, and there were a few funny things happening there. Uh, one thing that was sort of unusual that happened while I was in the hospitals was the SARS epidemic. Um, which was an interesting time to be there. That involved every day some, I don't know, 50 meters before the entrance of the hospital, having my ear checked for fever. And then if you didn't have fever, having to go into the hospital in a basically like a light biohazard suit, face mask, mask, gown, gloves, even if you weren't going anywhere near patients, just to walk in the halls. And so there's this experience in a large Canadian hospital uh, of seeing hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people all walking around, sort of afraid of being in contact with each other because there was this vague idea that you could get SARS and die. And there were some SARS-affected patients in the hospital because the hospital could do that. So that was an interesting moment just in a sense because it changed the experience of being in the hospital. Prior to that, it was a sort of place that, especially as a younger person, I felt very proud to go into, and now all of a sudden it felt risky. That was one thing that kind of got in there. The other thing that got in there was uh, I was invited to do a collaborative project with the Department of Psychiatry. So they were implanting these little devices that basically simulate being a little shocked, you know, if your heart starts to slow down. 
And when patients had this done, it felt like they were getting punched in the chest, but from within their chest. And the problem was that if you were, let's say, uh, in a typical situation, a uh, man often had this inserted, and let's say he was married to a woman, and they're lying in bed, and all of a sudden this thing goes off. So he feels like he's been punched in the head. The person sleeping next to him feels like, I don't know, they're next to a seizure or an earthquake. And then both people say, let's get this thing out of us, out of him. And then if he demands getting it out of him, he might die. So the question was, how do you make people feel more comfortable with the unpredictable possibility of having uh, like a bomb go off in your chest to keep you alive every now and then? But that was the first time I did anything kind of clinical, psychological in my life. I guess the broader context is growing up in Toronto, it was still very Anglo-Canadian then. Uh, no Sunday shopping. Almost no one lived in downtown Toronto. So at night, it was whisper quiet. There was a, then, I think, a city of about 4 million people, give or take. Now it's around six. But uh, no one lived downtown. So on Sunday, it was ghost town. I mean, the joke was that you could roll on your side down the street and you wouldn't be hit by a car because well, was, there was no shopping. Nothing was open. No bars were open, anything like this. Uh, it was the day that it was the Queen City. Uh, and as a result, no one talked about mental health or anything like this at all. I had no idea that such a thing as psychology or psychiatry or psychoanalysis, forget about, existed until I was in college. I'd never heard of it and or had a vague sense, you know, like a friend of mine's dad was very involved with eating disorders at the Center for Addiction and Mental Health in Toronto, CAMH. But it was the sort of like it was not interesting. It was some obscure thing it's as if he said, I don't know, he was a funeral parlor director. You know, it's like you might ask one question, but then after that, you think like, OK, everyone needs a job. So there was a sense, although I didn't really have an idea of this at the time, that there was a, it was shamefully self-indulgent to think much about your own mind in that way, except maybe philosophically. Uh, so I also had a Hebrew education, Jewish education, K through 12, where mental health was absolutely not part of the curriculum. Uh, in high school, I was asked to be a peer counselor, um, which is sort of funny thinking back on it. I don't think I impressed then as like necessary. I mean, I was a nice person, but like, I wasn't like Mother Teresa or anything, you know? So like, I mean, and the peer counseling was kind of banal and idiotic. It was, you know, how do you help people feel less stressed before they take a test? You know, the sort of thing that like nowadays, big corporations probably do, like, how do you feel better sitting in a cubicle or something all day? Or like they're doing that kind of uh, approach. But anyway, so there was that. And the other thing that happened in the hospitals was that back then there were salary caps. Um, you know, in social medicine, as in many countries, doctors can only earn so much. And so specialists around me in the Department of Cardiology back then would at some point, sometime in the summer or maybe in the early fall, hit their salary cap. And then all the work they did after that would be unpaid. So that was not somehow, not, that it was, not out of greed, but like I just watched what happened to them after they hit the cap. And if you're a patient, knowing that your doctor is no longer getting paid for the work they're doing, not that you assume money is the primary motivation, but, you know, they have family and blah, blah, blah. So that was something. And then the most high-minded thing that happened, the thing that I'd rather say was the only thing, we thought it's not true, is that it occurred to me that if from day one to day two, my idea of how the world is shifted dramatically, that as a cardiologist, uh, your practice wouldn't change at all that it's totally insulated, it's evidence-based, it's probably of all the fields of medicine one of the most evidence-based, and there's something that seemed really dreary about that, you know, sort of soul sapping. Uh, and the psychiatrists who I'd gotten to know by then all seemed to me quite strange, sort of character disordered, you know, they all looked sort of disheveled, and all the other doctors looked very happy, they looked sort of like they'd come out of a cave that morning, were doing some sort of dreary work. And it was a probably, I didn't know it then, but I think it was a very CBT focused place with a lot of emphasis on medication. They were doing some research in ECT then too. So in the hospital, at least there wasn't a feeling of an intellectual life and where there was a kind of academic life, it was in the way that people talk about academic medicine, you know, which is academically minded people approaching medicine in a way that is peripheral to and hopefully ultimately related to medicine. But the last part of that is the part that people care about the least. Um, so anyway, all this just to say, by the time I got to college in Toronto, uh, I'd gone in as a science student 
And midway through my first year, I thought I just don't want to do that. Like I was taking uh, the basic chemistry and biology courses, and they were interesting to me, but I no longer had the uh, motivation. So I switched midway through uh, Canada, like the British system. You didn't just apply to universities, but colleges within the universities. You declared your major right at the beginning. It was not a time for liberal arts, really. Uh, and I switched to arts and switched, like, replaced biology with German romantic literature and da 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 da. And basically switched my curriculum from uh, psychology, but in the sciences, to uh, the arts as well as art history was the other thing that I'd always been interested in and thought, well, if I'm going to make this change, I want to work that in more explicitly. Uh, then had the good fortune of be, uh, getting into a very small program. So in Canada as well, and like in the U.S., private universities are illegal, like where you are too. Uh, and uh, as a result, they're huge. So most of the universities have like twenty to 50,000 undergraduate students, and you could very easily get lost in a sea. Um, I joined a very obscure program, the History and Theory of Psychology program, which if I'm not mistaken had something like four or five undergraduates in it and a few graduate students, and four faculty, or five faculty, something like that. Uh, Morris Eagle, who some people know, uh, he had just left that program to come to Adelphi, where I ended up going for grad school, and the person who kind of took over his work was this guy, Ray Fancher, and I don't know all that much about Ray. He was a kind of very mild-mannered Canadian guy who had gone to Harvard in the 60s, and then had taught, I think, in Rochester when Bruno Bettelheim was there. Uh, and he was something of a Freud scholar, although he was, in general, a historian of, psycho of psychology. But he had one really nice paper, which no one reads because it was published in an obscure Canadian academic journal in the 70s called the Queen's Quarterly, taking up the claim of whether Freud was a misogynist. And I, my first Freud readings were with him. And my intro to Freud was reading the Project for a Scientific Psychology, which is a odd place to start, really. Um, but there was something about his, not just passion for, but delight in Freud in his methodical work in this project uh, that caught my interest. There was like, you know, to find a professor who could teach the project with a twinkle in his eye, and not because of some sort of like weird sort of obscure theory about what it really means, but really as it is, thought it was amazing, and not because he was a neuroscience booster either. He just thought, here's Freud's careful work there. Really got me hooked. So by the time I finished college, I'd written a thesis uh, on the difficulty of translating Freud into English, and I was applying to grad school, and I, the only place, I mean, I applied to a bunch of places, but wanted to go to a PhD program to be a psychoanalyst at that point. So I thought, all right, here's that thing that cardiology couldn't offer. Like, it's clinical, but it's also very philosophically driven. Uh, it has a nice set of theories behind it. Um, but I remember even in the middle of college, I imagine if someone would have said to me, like, how many psychoanalysts do you think there are in the world? I might have put that at, like, six or seven. Like, you know, it felt like no one did. It took, I don't know, it wasn't until the end of college that I had a sense that people were still practicing psychoanalysis. Which is funny because even then in Toronto there were two psychoanalytic institutes and there's a psychoanalysis bookstore which has been there then that's still there, Cavershan. And nevertheless, like if you didn't know about it, there was there was no PR going on back then, definitely not in Toronto as it was. So um, by the time I got to grad school everything was pretty solid, you know, and that I knew I wanted to be a psychoanalyst. Clinical psychology seemed like a reasonable way to do it. And uh, but I like came to New York and had never been in therapy before, and then all of a sudden was in my first therapy session. I don't know, sometime in my first year in New York, uh, which now is getting close to two decades ago, and I uh, found it all very foreign, you know. And I remember speaking to family about some experiences, of, like what it's like to be in clinical psychology, and it was the same line I, I was there when I was a kid, which is like, how do you spend all this time talking about yourself? You know, how awfully self-indulgent, how decadent, you know, but like, almost as if like I was abandoning work on the family farm. Um, but there was no family farm, and there was no expectation like that at all. So, anyway, that's, you know, the long and the short of it. And then I, what was also unusual for me in terms of formally entering psychoanalysis was that I did an externship uh, at New York Psychoanalytics. 
And then I wasn't even finished graduate school, and they had just started this new research fellowship. And I started analytic trading before I finished my PhD, which was sort of disorienting, actually, in a way. Um, it was disorienting also to be wanted so much. I, I mean, I think that's my primary reason I went there, was because I was overwhelmed by their sense of how much they wanted me to come, which sort of bypassed any kind of thinking I had. I thought, okay, I'll go. And I mean, the story that you know. Um, but uh, I thought, okay, I'll go. It's a conservative place that teaches Freud and fantastic. Like, I want that foundational classical education. You know, the reality turned out to be more varied. But uh, yeah, so by the time I finished my PhD, I was midway through the coursework of psychoanalytic training, which allowed for a pretty easy transition into this bizarre life now. Yeah, I'm finding there's more of a need than ever that I can see for Umbahagen because, um, like, coming here, you know, in New York, there's so many different choices and so many different places and so much going on with psychoanalysis. But then coming here, they only have one institute. And I gave a talk there, and it's very much like our old institute. So it's not somewhere that I'm going to be. Plus, everything's in Swedish, so I can't... Uh, Mm -hmm. understand what they're talking about um, yet. <laughs> but um, yes, yeah, so I see like, what would an analyst do? You know, there's only one choice if someone's interested. And there's not in the entire country, there's only one place, you know. So now I see more than ever how important it is for people to have these kinds of options of different ways to train. Yeah, I mean, I um, had the experience in 2007, I think, I did the research training program for the IPA and had just so happened that year that half of the delegation that came was from Lisbon. Uh, and I then started getting a sense of Portuguese psychoanalysis. And at the time, it might still be the case, I'm not sure, they had two institutes basically in the whole country, or at least in Lisbon, but I think the whole country, maybe Porto had an institute, but a fledgling one. And if I, I remember correctly, it was basically one was IPA and one was non-IPA. And each one had started by a founder. And it really was like being on a small island, even though it's not that small a country, because it seemed to me half the country had been analyzed by one person who just died, actually, Carlos Armel Diaz. Uh, and I think, you know, people are quite devastated. I had some interaction with the guy. He seemed incredibly lovely. But I remember being at a friend's house and I was looking through some sort of photo book on her coffee table. And I'm looking, and it's a lot of family pictures of infancy through to later life of a person. And I, having spent some time at the beginning of the book where they show this little baby basically breastfeeding, I said to my friend, who is this? And she said, oh, that was my analyst. <laughs> like, you know, so it's funny what happens in small places as well. So I agree. I mean, what you say makes a lot of sense. I mean, New York, as you know, is oversaturated with psychoanalytic institutes. I don't know for better at all, really. I mean, in a way, it's kind of silly that there's so many of these institutes, except why not? I mean, people want to make an institute, they could pay rent, they could get a sign and some business cards. Okay, fine. I mean, half of them don't have like a theory, exactly, but they exist. So to be in a place where there's only one, I think also kind of produces a certain interesting sense of possibility because every single person in a place where there's just one institute has some fantasy of something else. That's true. And there are some Lacanians uh, in Gothenburg, which is the second largest city, and it's on the other side of the country. So I've uh, met with them a couple of times. Um, so, yeah, so there's one, like, small Lacanian group of, like, four people, and then, and then one IPA institute. Yeah. But, yeah, that's why we're going to have this conference in Copenhagen and get kind of people from the area to get together to see what the New Yorkers and them have been doing and what we can all do together. That sounds fantastic. Yeah. No, I mean, I, as you know, I'm, I've had this experience of putting these conferences together where you get people from some far-flung places. I mean, as you'll remember, like from New Zealand, for example, you know, Maury Health Service. And uh, there's something always both very interesting and very weird about what's happening in those places. I guess to take this moment to go back to the earlier one, one of the challenges for me going into psychoanalysis, and even today, although it doesn't feel like a problem anymore, is that I don't especially revel in like the company of so many people, not out of snobby reasons, just because of my personality. It's just I could do it. But, you know, like I have 
colleagues, I'm sure you do too, who have like seven group supervisions every week and these people become family-like for them and there's all this intimacy and there's crying and there's personal disclosure and also a sense of great professional accomplishment. Uh, to me, that idea sounds terrible. I can't do that. I just can't. I, I don't want to be alone exactly, but I want to be able to be alone for most of the time. And so I'm always tempted. You know, like in Iceland, where two, the first two conferences were, there are two or three practicing analysts in the entire country. Now, granted, it's a small country, you know, maybe 450,000 people. But even by ratio, that's not very many in a Western country. And the prospect of like being the only psychoanalyst in like the Snipes Nest Peninsula, where there are I don't know a few thousand people, to be like in a little house in the middle of like a glacier or something. That sounds great. Uh, and incidentally, it's funny because I remember in grad school in the first week there were all these messages that professors were sending that I think were all like neurotic expressions of their own feelings of their own lives professionally. And a couple of them from one guy in particular always stood out to me. One guy said. Uh, you know, a plumber in Long Island makes more than you probably ever will. I'm like, all right, that's great. And who cares? I mean, I'm not trying to compete with the plumber. The other one was, welcome to the loneliest profession in the world. And, you know, I think there's, a, it's a little bit, I don't know, can I say hysterical? It was a hysterical comment, I think. Um, but I also think that uh, there's reality to it. And I think for those of us who are in full-time practice, you know, by the end of the day, when you leave and you realize what you haven't been able to say all day, uh, it's an interesting challenge. And I think you learn a lot about a person by what they do with that challenge. You know, there are some who hit the bar. There are some who have families, you know, and do that. Some who have friends. But I think everyone suffers something from that um, without being too heroic about it. It's not heroic exactly, but it's... Uh, it's there's a personal sacrifice, you know, in all of it, and how you compensate yourself. Some people are very lucky that they can compensate themselves by having colleagues who they love. Um, but in times with people who are not psychoanalysts, I find to be the most refreshing thing possible. You know, getting out of the shop a little bit and speaking to someone, and they say something, and you say something back, and they look at you like you're utterly perverse, and you realize that you need to get out more. And you hang out with too many analysts. <laughs> yeah, it's just, I don't know. I mean, you see the excesses. I was thinking about this a little bit. I mean, not knowing what we would speak about. But, I mean, among things that passed through my mind, especially right now, I just last night, uh, for a little bit, uh, between events, was watching some of the uh, impeach articles of impeachment uh, announcements uh, in Congress. Um. And I guess thinking about this after that, maybe earlier today, I thought to myself, like, you know, one thing that psychoanalysts can do to fill their time sometimes is invent opinions about things that psychoanalysis has so little to say anything about, which is one of my personal gripes. Like, I personally, I don't mean this to suggest a behavior for anyone else, but personally can't find a stitch of interest in what most psychoanalysts, really any psychoanalyst, have to say about politics. I don't care. At all, it doesn't seem interesting to me. I mean, it might be they're interesting, but if they're interesting, it has nothing to do with the fact that they're psychoanalysts often. And it's like you know, I, I have a joke that I share with some, but it's always in my head that psychoanalytic politics correspond to zip code. That's all. In other words, if you are in New York City and you have a psychoanalytic critique of Donald Trump, I'm like okay, why do you need to be a psychoanalyst? So. You know, I think getting out and actually speaking to people, like having friends who are politicians, or having friends who are economists, or having friends who are struggling sculptors living under Coney Island, you know, um, is so important because despite everything Freud says about culture, the reality is that the culture that we spend most of our time in is that the culture of one person's mind concurrently. And I think that... Uh, in certain ways, it's very limiting, I find, personally at least, of having a broad view of things informed by practice. So, I don't know why that seems so important to say right now, except to say that, I guess it's just timely, you know, I guess with Brexit and with the UK elections today as well. It's like I have two psychoanalyst friends contact me yesterday, text messaging me about the UK elections. One who really hopes that the Tories win, because if, you know, he says that, like, 
a vote for Corbyn would be a vote for hatred of Jews, and how could any psychoanalyst countenance that kind of hatred? And the other one says, Brexit is xenophobia and hatred of immigrants. How could anyone who has a conscience about the world and is handling their own aggression get behind Brexit? And I, my reaction to this is like, I want to have a cup of coffee right now because, you know, what do you do with this? You can have a kind of different conversation. But anyway, I, I think what I like, maybe just to say that what I like about psychoanalysis, actually, is I think it's kind of limited. It's not a theory of everything. I mean, only like Stephen Hawking is so immodest to kind of imagine these sorts of things. It just isn't. There are lots of things that psychoanalysis, I think, has nothing to say about. Um, I have a very dear friends kind of working on psychoanalysis or a psychoanalytic uh, approach to climate change, right, or climate change denial. And, you know, psychoanalysts have something to say about denial, but I don't know. It's like, what's, where do sociologists take over? Like, that's a field that I've never really paid that much careful attention to. I realize I don't personally feel driven towards sociology, but, like, they are studying things more than one person at a time. Where do anthropologists take over? You know? I don't know. Yeah, and so scientists. I, exactly. <laughs> Somewhere out there, there are people who are doing things with a specialized knowledge. And as an old friend of mine who's written about this has said, it's like if a biologist comes up with a hypothesis... And a physicist says, that's actually not a biological hypothesis, it's a physical one. The biologist will say, oh, you're right, that's interesting, it's really not my domain. But there's a certain kind of psychoanalytic need sometimes, I think maybe sometimes born out of a feeling of marginalization, where you feel like if we're going to be relevant, we better have something important to say about everything. I don't know, to me that's never been what it's about at all. So. No, it's. I really love um, just listening to different analysis and like hearing the internal workings of all these different people's minds especially like private practice I guess when I was in private practice full-time like you know 10 patients a day um I guess then it got a little bit more kind of always similar similar themes but when I worked in hospitals more and different with different kinds of populations and people going through more like critical experiences like like serious mental illnesses or uh serious physical illnesses it's just you just come in contact with so many people that you otherwise never would yeah yeah i mean that's also another interesting phenomenon politically is the question of like i definitely people tell me all the time that their practices are filled with like kind of say political worry about the country let's say um i wouldn't for whatever reason i don't i don't i don't mean pseudo naive but it's not true for me I find, actually. I mean, I would say that people coming to this office expressing concern about the state of the government is intermittent at best. There are one or two patients who kind of live in that world, you know, say, work in social justice, this sort of thing, where that's much more immediate. But I've wondered about it, you know, and I, I, my, my joking hypothesis is that I've always had a rule for my waiting room, which is I try to keep the publications balanced, like equal opportunity. Like, it's not all kind of like, it's not Z Magazine in a box set. It's, uh, you know, the New York New York Magazine, which has become actually really quite of a leftist publication politically recently, more than the New Yorker, uh, alongside, I don't know what, the Aaron Wall Street Journal kicking around or something like this. And I sometimes wonder if the appearance of some of both silences political speech. Oh. You know, like maybe if there are just like pictures of like, I don't know what, like a countdown timer of how many more days till Trump's term comes to an end. People would come in kind of beating the drum. But uh, I feel like right after the election, that's all anybody talked about for a few months. And then I feel like slowly people started to kind of get their their lives back. And because when it was happening where that was all like everybody was talking about all day, I felt really upset that you know, everyone's internal experience had turned into, like, focusing on this external problem. Like, if it was really sad to me to see how it affected everyone in that way. Sure. I mean, equally striking, I think, are the people who mentioned it not at all, who had no mention of it, whose life seemed, like, unconcerned with that for any number of reasons. Um, yeah, it's tricky. And, I mean, everyone practicing nowadays knows that, like, the kind of question of how to deal with people's sensitivities has been mediated by kind of cultural shifts in the way that sensitivities are considered, right? Long gone are the days of like, buck up and you'll be fine, you know? Uh, or like, uh, you know, 
it always makes me laugh how many times that be calm and carry on thing from you know England during the wars gets translated into like have a coffee at my coffee shop and carry on and all this. But that message, that old British civil message, how much it gets reproduced really just isn't the ethic right now. I think people kind of see those signs because they're still there. I just saw one yesterday, a bottle of gin that had copied the aesthetic of that perfectly, where the crown was, the same typeface. I was thinking about this. Uh, now it's like some sort of like, I don't know, mindful self-care idea where carry on is kind of not really taken seriously, but be calm. Um, and I guess people have to tell themselves to be calm if they live in a world that changes in ways they can't account for, which was part of the New York trauma of the Trump election because it seemed to upset the rules of physics. But we know that New Yorkers tend not to think of a world beyond the East and Hudson River. So Yeah, it seemed yeah. impossible in, to New Yorkers. Exactly. <laughs> but ask That's anybody a, else in the country. Right. <laughs> this old t-shirt says, you know, God is dead Nietzsche, and Nietzsche is dead God. It's like, you know, in so, the end, reality wins. So tell us about your conference next year, because I want to make sure we talk about it. Sure. So uh, after two conferences in Iceland of 2014-2018, it seemed time to find a different venue. Um, I, the Icelanders were wonderful. I cannot say enough good about how lovely it was to get to know them and how accommodating and welcoming they were. I can say a few bad things about the fact that VAT is 25% there, but, you know, but I'm sure, what is it there? Same. There too? Got it, yeah. It's amazing, you know, that a quarter of everything that you do with money goes into taxes in countries where income tax is like what seventy percent anyway. Uh, it's thirty percent. Thirty. Okay, that's not so bad. Not so bad. Um, Here. Yeah, mm -hmm. but like in Iceland, I mean, like traveling the countryside. Aside, I mean, which I've loved to do. Aside from seeing how beautiful it is, you realize that almost every town just has social housing. It's like, why are you in this little town with like a long two-story apartment building? It's like, because that's the social housing, and that's where everyone lives. So, anyway. They were great, and the whole point of starting the conference in the first place was as a kind of non-denominational, non-institutional conference, and very much inspired and having to do with kind of Unbehagen and the experiences of getting that going and seeing how it was going then, but also recognizing that one of its limits, despite uh, an extensive set of email lists then, was that it really was a New York organization. I mean, even if it had arms elsewhere, the mass was in New York and the events were in New York because that's what was happening. And even if there was an event somewhere else, there wasn't a critical mass. You could bring them like you're going to do in the summer. But back then, especially, that wasn't the case. So the hope was if it wasn't an IPA conference, you know, then the Lucanians would not get paranoid and the British Kleinians would get paranoid. But, you know, what can you do? Because, if, you know, they need that feeling. Um, but it was a great turnout. In the end, if I'm not mistaken, we had nearly 20 countries represented at that first conference, which really felt very good. And they weren't just like, say, Canada, the United States, and Western Europe. You know, we did have uh, one from New Zealand and Australia, a bunch from South America, a few from the Middle East. Um, there were certain areas that were hard to tap. We actually had no one except for a couple Lacanians from the UK. The British psychoanalytical rank and file were definitely, because I heard this from a few of them that I invited, too afraid to go to a place that was untested uh, and that had no institutional uh, imprimatur on it. Um, and so, anyway, after that first one, the second one was obvious. It was like, let's do this again and let's refine it. Uh, and the idea of working on foundational concepts just seemed so important and, and didn't feel like it was happening enough. And it's frustrating because anyone who goes to any meeting at any institute or talks to psychoanalysts knows that there's a kind of confusion of tongues, you know, in the field that is, I think you can't get rid of. But even like, you know, I mentioned denial before. I did a little bit of work towards a paper that hasn't been finished on the conceptual, you know, history of denial, which as a term... Uh, disappears mostly from the literature after a while as something other than appearing in a list of defenses. Um, but like if you say to someone, you know denial properly defined is a denial of conscious affective experience. That's all it is. To say someone's in denial means they're not feeling something consciously. It's not a comment about unconscious. I mean, there's an unconscious you know, background. But anyway, 
So having panels on how does psychoanalysis work was fantastic. I mean, at the first conference, I just saw one of the people in the story a few weeks ago, uh, Guy Legoffe from Paris, you know, that wonderful showdown moment on how does psychoanalysis work, where there you have Harold Blum, head of the Freud Archive in New York, uh, or in Washington, saying psychoanalysis works basically on, like, on a Freudian term. I mean, ego psychology on a Freudian terms. Uh, and then you have Guy with his big smile on his face saying, psychoanalysis works when I feel comfortable. And you know, silence in the room, some people aghast, some people ecstatic, delighted. Uh, looking around there made me think I want to keep doing these conferences. You know, it was more than that, and they got into what that might mean. So anyway, finding a venue for this next conference was itself a kind of challenge. I'm not even sure since it hasn't worked yet that it's, the right venue, but I like it a lot. Um, Ljubljana, I visited for the first time three summers ago, and I just passed through uh, on the way from Vienna to uh, the Dalmatian coast, and was really struck with it for a few reasons. One, it's a small but very beautiful city. The people seemed really lovely, receptive, responsible. It's a, a very clean city, like where you are, I'm sure it's the same. Like recycling is basically the most the predominant religion, and um, anyway, I th also historically, you know, they trace their history back to Jason and the Golden Fleece. But you know, who knows? Uh, at the very least, it's been at the crossroads of so many clashes of empires and civilizations and countries uh, through the Balkan Wars, etc. That it seemed like it had such a varied history. And so this past summer, I took a trip back there and thought, let's give this a go, with the hope that there, I mean, Iceland, one of the troubles is that it's hard to get to from almost everywhere. I mean, from New York, it was pretty straightforward, as long as you don't mind a red-eye flight that only lasts for five hours and that deposits you at 6 a.m. where you're going. Like, so you're exhausted, and you can't get into your hotel for seven hours. So Ljubljana has some logistical challenges, too, but uh, I think that the conference is going to run in a very similar way. And also is going to integrate something that started in New York in 2016, which was this Institute, No Institute conference uh, that a few of us put together, that really looked at like where does psychoanalytic formation happen? Um, and that question of where does it happen to me seems like such an important question. I mean, there's the kind of legislative questions of like, should psychoanalysts go to institutes or not? I mean, that to me is a secondary question. The first question is, where does the thing continue? And in a way, the answer is already known, right? It continues in people's personal analyses. Uh, I always think to the survey the Chicago Psychoanalytic did, I think about a decade ago, maybe longer actually, 15 years ago, where they surveyed all of their alumni and asked them questions like, to what extent do you still identify as a psychoanalyst? To what extent do you practice psychoanalysis now? But they also asked them to rate where they learned about psychoanalysis. And I, if I remember the pie chart well enough, something like 3% was classes, and then like maybe another some odd percent bigger than that was supervision, but like 70% was personal analysis, which is interesting. I mean, in a way, one learns in this way about this fascination with like the training analyst system or its equivalents in other places, because if that's where analysis is happening, then the institutes, all they can really do is control who gets to be the analysts. So anyway, the conference will take that on, and we'll see. You know, the nice thing also about Slovenia is that you get the Slovenian school, and all these interesting people in Ljubljana. Uh, and the person who's been most helpful early on has been Renata Slekal, who's really one of the, in addition to being brilliant, is one of the kindest brilliant people I've ever met. Yeah, and she's amazing. She really is an astounding human being, and I just spent a day with her, uh, part of a day. We ended up going to a performance later that evening by chance that she could get me a ticket to that was sold out. So I got to know her a little bit more there, but not only so much because we were in the dark in some performance art interactive thing. Um, but uh, it, I have a good feeling about it. We'll see. It's always nerve-wracking to plan an international conference where you aren't. You know, it's like I don't go to Ljubljana regularly. I've actually only been there a handful of times. But we'll see how it goes. We're just, just kind of getting it all together now. Hopefully next week it will be there. 
Um, and you know, cost is always a big factor, and it's such a hard one to work with. And I'm so sensitive to the idea that like most people, especially non-American analysts, but of course a bunch of American analysts, can't just shell out a couple thousand dollars to go to a conference. So the question also of like who will be there. So we, as we did in Iceland, are making a fee for the locals affordable because the living wage or the average monthly salary in Slovenia, I believe, is like 400 euros a month. You know, if everyone paid whatever the proportion of that is to go to a conference, you'd have to run it in a park. So it's tricky. You know, the finances piece is unavoidable often. Um, but I'm hoping we'll get more people from North Africa where there are analysts and Middle East and hopefully even like maybe former Soviet republics, maybe even China, you know. I don't know. I don't have like a fetish to bring in all these people and like make it a diverse international blah, blah, blah. I just would be happy if that happened. Absolutely. I've been fantasizing about making a whole trip of it and just like being on vacation and then like absorbing all of the talks and like not being stressed. Yeah, I like <laughs> that idea very much. Well, it's totally possible, especially like for North Americans, you have to, you can't fly directly there, right? So you can fly to Venice, or you can fly to Vienna, or you can fly to Zagreb. You could sometimes fly to, um, uh, to Belgrade. <laughs> Um, that's where I went next after that. And really just traveling the Balkans, like, you know, in a place, history there, just as an aside, have you ever been to Belgrade? No, but my husband says that that area is like his favorite part of the world. And it's just like astonishing. It is. It's such an interesting part of the world. I agree with him. And also the city itself is so unusual for so many reasons. Like for one, there's currently a war on alphabet where Cyrillic is being pushed out. But I went to the Museum of Yugoslavia, which was built during Tito's era, and it was basically a propaganda museum. They don't say this, of course, because they don't they can't say it, because they don't believe it, I don't think. But it like traces the Yugoslavian people back to antiquity, which is just a joke. Right? There was no such thing. There was no such thing as a Yugoslavian people. I mean, like anyway. So after Tito died, now it's half that and half like a dedication to the life of Tito. Who, by the way, cared more about fashion than any world leader I could tell. Like he makes I don't know, Melda Marcos looked like a slouch. The guy had like 7,000 suits and 9,000 batons to carry. Um, but in any case, it's an area where there's been such a war on history so many times. Um, and it creates people who really have an interesting consciousness about this sort of thing. And in Ljubljana, it's, it's all cleaned up and really wasn't destroyed very much by war. But in Belgrade, there are still buildings with bullet holes in them. You know, they don't have the money to clean it up. And I think in a way it's part of the public consciousness well enough that there's not a huge pressure to clean it up either. So anyway, we'll see. It's a different part of the world. And, you know, at least there are psychoanalysts or psychoanalytical theoreticians there. In Iceland, I, you know, when Freud said he was bringing the plague to America, I mean, in Iceland, the closest we got to that was someone making a flippant joke that on the days of the conference, that the Jewish population of Iceland was going to increase by 17,000% <laughs> from zero, basically. So, uh, but other than that, I mean, they, you know, psychoanalysis is not popular there except in the English departments. It, it has a similar fate. It's westernized enough that psychoanalysis has been marginalized uh, in the psychology department. But the hospitals were interesting places. And I always, that's the aspiration that I can never seem to work out in these conferences is how to bring people to a conference and then get them involved in local activities. Like I really wanted in the first conference to have psychoanalysts available, like almost like a panel of experts available to consult with local institutions, to really try to run a conference that doesn't feel like an American colonial experiment. Um, and I think we did that in other ways, but I think that you know to also include some sort of service to the community that you're in without being wishy-washy about it. I think it's nice because it's also a great way to get to know them. Yeah, Horker, uh, he came to this conference I did, I guess, this May in Italy. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, he was like, please, anything you guys do, please definitely let me know. I want to be involved because he's so, like, starved for, like, psychoanalytic community and thought and stuff. And mostly he works in business at this point, like, doing consulting and stuff like right. that. Yes. So, no, that man uh, is a great adapter to his necessity. Yeah. So, yeah, no, I mean, there were definitely people there. And I mean, there's some brilliant people in Iceland who have something to say about psychoanalysis, and they've stayed in touch. So, yeah, 
it's nice also. It's nice to get out of the U.S., as you know. You know, it's sort of your blood pressure goes down a little bit. At least mine does. It definitely <laughs> does. Is there yeah. anything else you want to talk about before we go? Because I want to make sure that you get to everything you wanted to mention. And I also know you have limited time. <laughs> um, I don't know. I mean, not. I don't have an agenda, I would say. Um, but... I will say, I guess, maybe one other thing that's somewhat conference-related and related to something else I've been thinking about, especially this week. So, in my practice, it's children and adolescents and adults and older adults. And with adolescents in particular, I guess I'm thinking about this both with respect to the conference as well as to this as a kind of medium of Skype. I've been thinking a lot about kind of the way that the surveillance of parents into children's lives changes the way that their minds function. You know, there is all this conversation about how social media is changing kids, which I think it has and will, just like other inventions, change kids, like probably electricity and then the telegraph and then the telephone and the car and all sorts and the train. Um, but uh, this idea that we get to practice this in this field that involves something that's face-to-face -face and private seems to me so important. And if anything, like the nice kind of pleasure of the conference is bringing all these people together in a way that's not digitally mediated at all, that isn't for attribution, unless desired, uh, and to have like a private conversation face to face with people whose breath you can feel on your face if they're sitting too close to you. Um, and I don't know, it's just something that I, the, to have something more sensual, I think is something that psychoanalysis can do. Uh, and it works very nicely against a lot of the, I think, uh, sterilizing elements or paranoia-inducing elements that are too prevalent right now. So maybe that's a kind of soapboxy thing to say at the end, but I increasingly feel concerned about people's right to uh, freedom in their own minds. Yeah, and I talked to Jill Gentile recently for this, and... You know, she, of course, writes about, like, hate speech and freedom of speech and democracy and that sort of thing. And, you know, just the space to be able to say whatever you need to say or want to say in a private space. Um, yeah. Because, you know, I talk now to my husband and then I open up my computer and there's an ad for whatever we're talking about. Because clearly my computer and phone are listening to our conversations in our house. So, yeah. so hopefully, you know, at least uh, nothing, nothing is private anymore as far as regular day-to-day -day life. So I feel like that private space is more essential than ever. Well, if Microsoft is selling this, I hope they link to your interview series. <laughs> That's our advertising for you. No, it's really quite bizarre. Um, but yeah, anyway... I'm grateful for the opportunity to have a conversation. It's nice to do this even over Skype. Uh, yeah. And uh, yeah, I'm glad that you're doing this conference too. I think all that kind of work to bring people together in a serious way, but also in a way that kind of allows for a bit of an exhale uh, makes this enterprise more viable. So I'm glad to be a fellow traveler with you in that effort. Absolutely. And if anything, I'll see you next October. <laughs> and delightful. Thank you for listening to Rendering Unconscious. You've just heard a conversation with Dr. Michael Stewart Garfinkel, a licensed clinical psychologist and psychoanalyst in private practice in New York City. He is on the teaching and supervisory faculty at the Derner Institute, Adelphi University, the new school. School of Medicine at Mount Sinai, the Institute for Psychoanalytic Training and Research, and Teachers College, Columbia University. For more information, please visit the conference website for next, When the Ice Melts, October 2020. Next2020.si. For more information, you can visit my website, drvanessasinclair.net, or the podcast website, renderingunconscious.org. Rendering Unconscious is also a book. Rendering Unconscious, 
psychoanalytic perspectives, politics, and poetry. Available from Trapart Books, 2019. Please visit our publisher's website, www.trapart.net. You can support the podcast by visiting our Patreon, p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash v-a-n-e-s-s-a two three c-a-r-l. Your support is greatly appreciated. Links to everything can be found in the text accompanying this episode. He leans forward, looking puzzled. Pierre, what's the matter with you? Camera tilts up and pans right with him as he abandons his work, gets up and goes towards his wife and takes her several years later. I have the sense that almost aspects of myself, visions of my son especially, the year after our project ended, processes, in order to effectively express such meanings and to translate abstract philosophical concepts in visual forms, One truly takes on the role of creator. It is possible that his ideas can serve as a springboard for inspirations, and they could all be seen as being inner of the mind. These processes are then through the ego. If the inner is inspired, somehow, by vulnerability, as well as its off-screen. Sighing. My God, there goes another lost chance of suffering. Surprised. Turning. Why do you say that? At the bar, Pierre and Severine come in, approach the camera, and stop. Severine, no, don't, let's go. She glances behind them. She's of this art through imitation, and used to lure prey. Almost universally, animals cannot fake. They do not participate in the adherence to a certain technical language, or yoga, meditation, or even specific religious. And this is expressed through a conscious ego, an externally controlled or imposed field. <laughs>